Hi and welcome to Inside Story, the API's magazine program and your one-stop source for what's taking place in your country and your community. I am Nadia Slater. Coming up, from Watland Arb to modern structures, we look at the housing development here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Our brothers and sisters across the ocean try to reconnect as Ghana and St. Vincent and the Grenadines foster closer ties. We sat down with caseworker Camille Johnson to learn more about the foster care program. We deal with land ownership in the OECS on this week's Community Beat. And Inside Minutes encourages you to have your children eat healthier. Those stories coming up on this week's Inside Story. Stay with us. Our natural history includes the long-tailed white tropic birds that migrate to our skies and rock faces. The North Atlantic humpback whale that comes to our warm waters to give birth to and nurse their young. The critically endangered hawksbill turtle and the St. Vincent parrot. These are all creatures that the National Trust seeks to protect for future generations. For more than 40 years, the National Trust has worked to save St. Vincent and the Grenadines' most beloved places, landscapes and seascapes where great moments of history took place. We work together with communities to value and protect important pieces of our cultural community, national history and environment, such as the series of decorated Salvador pots found in Clear Valley, signifying that St. Vincent's civilization is almost 2,000 years old. We do this all because the next generation needs to know our stories, as they will only inherit the places and species we choose to save today. We urge you to plant a tree under whose shade you never plan to sit. Join the National Trust today. Welcome back. This year, St. Vincent and the Grenadines will celebrate its 40th anniversary of independence. Strides have been made in so many sectors, one of which Vincentians take pride is housing. Houses go from small structures to mansions in a few years. St. Vincent and the Grenadines' development over the years is multifaceted. Historically, this country holds the distinction of being the last colonized territory in the Caribbean. Its history is dynamic and its role in the liberation struggle of the region is often downplayed. After emancipation, land ownership became an issue and with it proper housing. In the early years, housing was mainly wattle and daub. By the 1950s, governments began to construct housing for Vincentians with what was dubbed planned houses, the construction of two bedroom and a hall or hall and chamber. By the 1980s, the Housing and Land Development Corporation took on a mandate for housing, offering small loans to potential homeowners. But Vincentians on a whole began their own revolution, so to speak. Concrete additions to wooden structures were very common. In fact, this would happen, and virtually overnight, a complete concrete structure would emerge. By the turn of the millennium, government would introduce a housing movement unparalleled in the region. Second term after the 25 elections, a specific ministry was de designed and developed for housing, of which Minister Francis was the first minister to have taken charge of that. Though initially, in the, in the earlier part, 2001-2005, the ministry was attached basically to to, um, the Ministry of Housing was attached to, to, to um, the Ministry of Transport and Works. But by 2005, after that period, the, the, the government thought that you should have a specific ministry dealing with housing. And so the, the ministry was created then at that time to take care specifically of, of, of um, the more, the more um, housing needs that, that existed then. The government has always maintained the position of a, a no income a low-income housing program in this country. When one reflects on the levels of salary between certain bands, of course, that the government came up with a policy of both no and low-income housing. Housing schemes also opened up in Peters Hope, Clare Valley, Green Hill, Peter Bodell and San Susi. Land ownership was intensified. People were given title to land that they had occupied for generations. Informal settlements or squatting were regularized into residential areas with proper drainage. There was a Lives to Live project. 
they began to give 100% mortgages to civil servants. From then, the government policy continues to rise. And, and where I think that we would have also um, gained momentum is where when the, 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 this country would have had a number of disasters um, where the government responded in assisting in rebuilding houses for, for those who were affected in these disasters. And um, to date, we have done quite well in terms of the numbers of houses we have built in this country. While we would have done well equally at that time, in our third term, the Prime Minister recognized that, of course, that there was also another band of individuals who he considered unfortunate and asked that we develop a program in our ministry to deal with that. And that is the Lives to Live program. And again, a number of individuals have benefited tremendously from the Lives to Live program. So that not only have we established the no and low income housing program, but equally to assist with those who are less fortunate and the elderly. Well, I just say change rapid again concerning a building because right about now anybody who leave the home and come to anything like say 20, 25 years up always looking for their own home. So you see a lot of increase in homes now, especially with young people building their own home. And how they could get this 100 100 loan percent mortgage. A lot of people exp expand on that. So they always see people coming to do business, building house and looking for their own property. Chris Wilson is a veteran contractor and builder. He has been in the business for over 30 years. He says the housing industry here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines has grown tremendously. Oh yeah, in the early, early days, they used to get a house built with more solid blocks. But now, that was, that is, let's see, over 30 years, 30, 40 years, I don't made a build house with solid blocks, but now, house built with hollow blocks. So they say the hollow blocks could take the heat and even the shock movements and all like that would crack, so. What do you mean when you say you say hollow blocks as opposed to solid blocks? Well, the, the hollow blocks carry some hole within them and the solid blocks is solid. So it's two different blocks. Solid is the solid concrete blocks, but now the hollow blocks carry holes in them. Okay. So, so that's the difference. So how, the, how they use to construct and uh, them blocks in them? Is the same cement and...? Yeah, cement. Yeah. Most of the time you used to get this stuff from the sea and they mix it up the same way and they have something and ram it down and turn it over and thing it out. But now you get machine building the hollow blocks and, and so on. Yeah. So in your opinion, what you, which one you think used to work better? Well, you could say the hollow blocks better now because walking and getting, especially doing construction and to get the like the conduit them between the blocks and them and all, so, so you could get the conduit from, from start right up. But long time, you can't do that. You have to cut back the wall. So most of the time, people put the conduit in the wall because of the hollow blocks. So the hollow blocks service is more better. This boom in the housing industry has brought forth another issue, following proper building codes and guidelines in the construction of modern homes. Engineer Desmond Pompey explains. If you look at the credit unions, to my, in, in my view, they are the pillars in our financial sectors right now. A lot of people deal with them and they give mortgages and they like to know that they get value for their money. The physical planning inspector becomes the superhero now because he goes out and he inspects and he delivers quality control mm -hmm. at no cost to the homeowner. That's what you get. You get a quality assurance at no cost to the homeowner, making sure that your building is constructed according to, to, to standards. 
In addition to that, what we have also seen is not only improvement in the designs and the involvement of our more involvement of our professionals, engineers and architects, we have also seen a lifting of the performance of the builders and the contractors as a result of the involvement of the inspectors at Physical Planet. I would like to see that the standard of building lift and try and build more stronger and safer house. I mean, right now, in the Caribbean, I just always say we have one of the strongest house. But I mean, we could do something still more to make it more efficient. So, I would like to see more contractors do what they're supposed to do, especially starting from the foundation of the house. Because if you have no foundation, it will be a problem. So we must have that good foundation that can be able to stand the weather when it comes. I have discovered buildings that reach significant levels of progress that no inspector have been to because of the location. And nobody indicate that the building has started. And you have a responsibility to indicate to the physical planning department when you start construction. That is a responsibility that the homeowner has under the law. And you have the responsibility also to call us in for the inspection. I mean, we go out and we drive and we look around for things. But you can't just say that physical plan and don't come and inspect. You have the responsibility to call us in to inspect at the various stages. When the foundation is done, when you're casting and so on and so forth. And the law says that you must give us seven days notice. Seven days notice. And we work with one day notice. Sometimes a man going concrete. Today he calls us the same day. But we work with it. But the law says seven days notice. Seven days notice means that the builder must organize himself. And we'll bring you part two of the housing development in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in a subsequent program. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Thanks for staying with us. The Republic of Ghana is a West African country which shares historical ties to the Caribbean and St. Vincent and the Grenadines in particular. Surnames such as Kujo and Kwashi are directly linked. In late 2018, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez and a delegation visited the continent of Africa specifically the Republic of Ghana. While there, the Prime Minister signed a memorandum of agreement on cooperation and closer ties. He visited industries and held meetings with stakeholders, especially in the booming cocoa industry. Now, the Republic of Ghana and St. Vincent and the Grenadines share special historical ties, as it is believed the Africans who were brought to St. Vincent and the Grenadines as slaves came from this part of the world. <laughs> the Prime Minister visited one of the holding chambers close to the coast. The Ghanaian coastline is dotted with imposing European forts, harboring harrowing reminders of the intense and complex history of the transatlantic slave trade. Scarcely any renovations have been made to these quarters, except for cleaning. One of them sits below a church. Rainwater was used to fill it, so there are pipes to the roofs and when it's rainwater collected in there. When this was full, it had 20,000 gallons. When the Dutch took over, they wouldn't trust the Portuguese, thinking it could be poisoned. So they stopped using this and had a bigger one built in the main courtyard. But then sadly, when the same Dutch guy who was thinking this could be poisoned, picked a needle to be used, then the water to him poisoned became good enough to clean off. 
Today we're not using the sauce, but it's been proven. Water in mm -hmm. there was not poisoned. These holding cells and dungeons held men, women and children as they in transit point to the ships and then to the plantations of the New World. And all of a sudden, a lighter kind of skin baby shows up. And before, the men would not take it lightly. They will ask hard questions as to where the woman got the baby from. Yes. But today it is changing because they are better appreciating what happened in the past. Yes. And possible effects. Yes. The day themselves became too big, such that some, if no most, were unable to move from where they were to where the containers were in during the day. So practically they had everything on the floor and they were sleeping in it. Jesus. Meaning that what you see today is some time past. Had phases during vomit, menstrual blood, and we seriously cannot underestimate the heat and stench. And these, among others, explains why they were dying. And those that died were thrown into the sea. They were first constructed by the Dutch, traders and then the Portuguese. The corridors are literally corridors of death and these sacred sites are features of dark tourism in Ghana. It should compel us to pray for those who died to rest in peace, those who love to return and find their roots, and that man never regain perpetrate such injustice against man, and with the living ought to vow to oppose us. In 2019, Ghana is taking the lead in the reparations movement with the year of the return. The country is inviting people of African descent to visit Ghana. Hello, my name is Catherine Afiku, the Minister for Tourism, Arts and Culture of the Republic of Ghana. And next year is the year of return that our President of the Republic, Excellency Nana Adudanko Akufuado, has spearheaded and tasked the Ministry of Tourism to lead this very significant year of bringing back home the sons and daughters of African descent in the diaspora. And you would ask, why? Well, next year is 400th anniversary commemoration of when slavery began when sons and daughters of the continent were taken away to exactly uh, 1619 to Jamestown in Virginia in the New World. So we as a nation, knowing our Pan-African credentials, have taken it upon ourselves to open the gateway for the African descendants in the diaspora to make a pilgrimage, to come home, to do the full circle. Yes, we are the descendants of the people were taken away by force through uh, uh, horrible means, but we have survived as a people. If you look at the Caribbean, if you look at Latin America, if you look at the Americas, in Europe, all the races do have a place to return, but it's only the African in the diaspora who's always at a loss as to which country or which home to call his or her home. And Ghana is leading this crusade that next year we want to open the doors. We've done it before, but next year we'll be on a larger scale. In the 80s, Ghana in its constitution had something called the right of abode, where we open the doors for our people to come and live and to have a sense of belonging on the continent from Ghana. The year-long celebrations include a Back to Africa festival and Ghana Carnival. We launched it in August of this year and in September we traveled with the president to America to officially launch it and also to link it to a law that has been passed by an act of Congress called HR 1242 which is turning next year the year of the African American experience. So we are also uh, picking back on that one. We went to the US to launch it in September. In January, we're going to have one of the illustrious sons of the soil, uh, a son of uh, Robert Mr. Mali, Bob Mali, his son Damien Mali, in collaboration with a star of Ghana uh, called uh, Fuse ODG. They'll do a concert called Come Home, but in uh, a Ghanaian language, uh, dubbed Brafier, it means come home. That will be the kick, the kickstart concert in January. 
in February, it's historically a Black History Month. And where we are today is actually the burial ground of W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the earlier returnees from the diaspora to live and die here on the continent. June, a homecoming investment summit. When the diaspora returned, it's not just for fun fair, but it also just like the Prophet Nehemiah, to help rebuild Africa through business, not charity. So they come home, they get a piece of investment, and they work with their contemporaries on the continent to rebuild what was scattered as a result of the human resources that was taken away. In July, we have the pan Pan African Festival that was instituted about 20, 30 years ago, and it will also be a commemoration of our people coming home. In August, we have the African American African American Emancipation Period, where they come home, we do the atonement, and we also lay wreath on some of the heroes that are buried here, that E.B. Du Bois, George Padmore, Kwame Kuma, a lot of the uh, former Pan-African leaders of the past. And then in November, we climax it with Ghana Carnival. We will be, of course, speaking from the Trinidadians, uh, the St. Vincent Grenadines, and all the brothers and sisters in the diaspora who celebrate African culture on the other side. And in December, we climax it with Afro China. It's just a musical mega concert with all the stars of African descent. But we want this to be the beginning of the return. It's a symbolic message. Throughout the year, we plan to come to visit the CARICOM, the entire uh, spectrum of the brothers in the Caribbean, starting with St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We want to come out there and promote the pilgrimage. But beyond 2019, we want this to be a commemoration that every year, uh, just as people travel to Israel, they travel to Europe, we want Ghana to be the beacon of the gateway to have a peace of the motherland. So every year, we can choose any day or month of the year and come home to be a part of that symbolism. So it's something that will just kickstart in 2019, but it will continue. And we expect our cousins, <laughs> sons and daughters to return, to actually have that sense of closure as well as an opportunity for investment from Africans in the diaspora and the opportunity to own land. Those of us out there, the mystery of Africa being full of diseases, war and poverty, thanks to technology, has been demystified. We are encouraging you and inviting you to come home, come to Ghana, the center of the world, where tradition lives. Come to Ghana, where you will actually feel the warmth and the hospitality of a people that truly resonates with you. You will feel at home. We're urging you to take this pilgrimage, come to Ghana, be a part of the year of return and beyond. But most importantly, have a piece of Africa with you. Do not be a guest, be a returnee that will own a piece of the continent. Okay, so I know the intentions, and when you say that they can own, you need to explain to them whether they can come and buy land in Ghana. Yes. So, yes, and when I say own a piece of the continent, I mean literally you can own a piece of land, buy land outright. It's a leasehold for 99 years. That's enough lifetime. So you can have a piece of Africa, build your home, have a vacation, instead of having it at Côte d'Azur or Monaco, have it in Ghana and be a proud son and daughter of the continent. Yes, you can own a piece of land. I am very delighted for your invite. Very soon, myself and a few of my staff, we will come to visit you in St. Vincent and the Grenadine and also travel along the CARICOM countries to promote the year of return, but most importantly, to connect with our family, our kin and our folk in the diaspora to encourage them to come home and be a part of the celebration. Oh, I, I, will, I will urge people from all over the world who come here, in particular persons from the new world, the so-called new world, the Caribbean and, Brazil. and Brazil, Latin America, North America, that they they respond to the government of Ghana and come and visit. Of course, the Ghanaians who are abroad and other persons of African descent and others who have built societies with persons of African descent to come here. 
because the, 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 the president of Ghana and through the Ministry of Tourism and Culture, they have a, a very big year planned, a lot of activities. It's also a big year for tourism for Ghana, but more importantly for learning and for remembering. Memory is very important. On a subsequent program, we'll bring you more on the Prime Minister's visit to Ghana. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is committed to the welfare and protection of the nation's children. In 2015, the Child Care and Adoption Act was instituted, focusing on the interest and protection of the child. The foster care program is part of that protection. Case worker Camille Johnson in the Child Development Unit talks more about the foster care program in the following interview. Today we're going to be talking about um, the foster care program here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, tell us a bit, what is foster care? Foster care is an arrangement um, with a family who volunteers um, to keep, to have children in their home. Um, and they have to first be assessed by our unit and approved before the children move into the home. Okay. Um, is it a temporary arrangement, permanent? Uh, it's more of a temporary arrangement. It can be short term, long term, or long term. Um, short term being it can be like a day, a night, a weekend. Um, long term, anything from six months to three years. Because the Child Care and Adoption Act of 2015 stipulates that it must go up to three years. Um, well, within that that period of time, but no more than three years. Okay. Adoption, more or less, is as we said, is a more permanent mm -hmm. arrangement where the parents give up their rights and responsibilities. They have actually sign a consent form for that. Um, but with foster care, mm -hmm. it is temporary. It is known that basically the child is just staying in that situation for whatever time arrangement, and then they go back to their families. Um, if it's a case of an orphan who would have lost maybe both parents, then adoption, which is more permanent, is an option. Or we usually look within the biological family, you know, the extended family, to see if they can help care for the child. Um, but you do have cases where persons or you see a child on the road or a child keeps coming by you and you realize the child doesn't have a good home and you say, well, okay, I'm going to provide for that child. Um, it is not, there are a lot of it going on in the community still, but it's not through our department. Um, but our department, basically, that's, that's the arrangement that we call, we have the foster care system. So if after three years, the, the, the family, you know, falls in love with the child and wants to take the child, what's, what do they do? It can go to a more permanent arrangement, adoption. Adoption is more permanent. That means that the parents, they basically give up the parental rights and responsibilities. And that's another process that, um, that we would go into. But the foster care is just temporary. It's just basically volunteering to, you know, give a child an opportunity to have a, a stable life, a family life, while we work with the biological um, parents. Um, and then um, reintegrate them because okay. at the end of it reintegration is the, the central aim. Um, you mentioned the Child Care and Protection Act of 2015. Um, tell us a bit about the different areas this act covers. The Children Care and Adoption Act of 2015 it guides caseworkers as to how to deal with um, child abuse cases so when they're reported whether to the Child Development Division or to the police um, we more or less help out with the assessment, the investigation, um, and it gives us a guide as to how to go through that process, basically. Okay, well, and so this means that you work closely with the, the police department? Yes, we do, we definitely do. Process of someone becoming a foster parent? Um, okay, so they would come to the Office of the Child Development Division. We are located in Paws Avenue across from the Searchlight Newspaper Office. Um, downstairs, the Serious Offenses Court. Uh, we have an application form that is filled out. So you'd have to bring your identification, a copy of um, 
police record and a character reference. Um, we fill out the application form and then the persons must expect that the caseworker would come to their home to do an assessment and also within the community that they live because we need to check out to make sure that you know everything is intact before the child goes there. So do you have um, families that are like continuously like foster parent foster homes? Yes we do have pair um, families that would you know after a child moved we may send another child there and they, they usually help us out from time to time. Okay. How difficult um, is it, you know, being a caseworker and having to deal with, with all these um, cases? <laughs> uh, well, it goes by a case-to-case basis. It, as reports are given, um, there are just three caseworkers in the Child Protection Unit and we have to cover the whole of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So it can be challenging at times, um, more or less stretching ourselves thin, but we, we usually try to work along with communities, work along with the persons there and you know, ask for their help because we can't do it by ourselves. We have to more or less work, work along with the different stakeholders. So we, as I said, the police usually work along closely with them, um, the healthcare system, the educational system, because you know we'd have to go to the schools, talk to the teachers and stuff like that, go to the clinics, talk to persons. So. Um, even as challenging, we, we have persons out there who we work along with closely who we can, it, it makes it a little easier. How is the relationship, because you know, there's just three of you, um, all these different communities, how is the relationship with the communities? Do you get um, a lot of reports? Do they, do they talk? Um, the reports usually come in, um, maybe not as, as steady as we would like them to, um, but you would more find persons would come sometimes through the police. Um, they would they would go to the police and then the police would call us in. Some persons don't really want to come to an office to do it, but we are out there as well. So once they know that we are in the community, they would come and you know tell us. And we usually have workshops and other activities so it gives them that opportunity while we are there in the community to come to talk to us as well. Okay. Um, do you offer any form of counselling for um, the children while they're in foster care and some of them are very young and might have gone through very traumatic experiences? Mm -hmm. Yes we do. Um, we usually work along with different um, agencies to provide counselling because we have the um, psychologists at the hospital and we usually use um, other other agencies where there is counselling to give help to the children. How do you assess uh, um, a, a foster family? After you have done the initial investigations and so forth and say they might have a child and the child probably spend a couple of months and, and so forth, do you do an assessment after? Yes, we usually do follow-up assessments. So it's not just placing the child there and then you forget them. Um, you'd have to go back, you'd have to check maybe in with the home, talk to the child, you know, see that everything is okay, talk to the parents. And we usually have... Um, the foster guardians are actually, they have to go through a period of training we have a, where they can get their certificate as well. Um, so even through that medium, they are able to express themselves as if they're having any problems and stuff with the child. Um, we usually go to the school for the child so that we keep abreast of what is happening at school and, you know, even talk to community members. You know, if you've seen the child around, is everything okay? Do you think that it's a good family and stuff like that? So like I see a child on the road and I say, no, but let me take the child, you know, have the child live with me. Do I, do I need to come um, um, to you? You can come to the department, report maybe how the child got into your care. So we can do our assessment or investigation as to, okay, so why was the child on the road like that at that time of night or something? And maybe we can assess to see if it was a form of abuse. So would, would you say we have, we have enough per people coming forward to to be part of the foster care program or you need more? We need more. We definitely need more. It's not nearly as enough. Um, we need persons to come forward and volunteer of their time, volunteer, you know, to 
love and nurture and care for a child because at the end of the day that's what they need and we really need to go back to that saying that it takes a community to raise a child you know don't just think that because they're abused or because they have a certain you know they have certain behavior problems maybe with your with the help um, and the love and care they can be better children and grow up to be you know our future and we'll have more on the foster care program in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in a subsequent program. Stay with us. Community Beat is up next. They are small and impressionable. How you interact with them is very important. So don't believe for one second that anything you do won't leave a lasting impression. The power to make a positive impression is in your hands. By playing with them, reading to them, talking and singing to them, you can help them develop positively because children are never too young to learn. This message was brought to you by the UNICEF Office for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, the Caribbean Child Support Initiative, and this station. Ramona, welcome to ECCB Connects. Thanks for having me, Karina. Now, the ECCB has embarked on an exciting project in the form of the Electronic Conveyance and System Project. Tell us, what was the thinking behind this system? So this project, Karina, would have actually started since about January 2014. Coming out of the financial crisis, the Monterey Council would have noted that there were several issues that, as it relates to land security and land transactions, and they would have formed a high-level committee of individuals with the purpose of answering the question whether or not the region could benefit from a harmonized system as it related to land transactions and land registration. And that committee would have comprised individuals from all over the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, including land registrars, would have had representatives from the ECC, the OECS Bar Association, the ECCU Bankers Association, as well as representatives from the ECCB who would have participated in it. Ramona, from what you've said, we have quite a diverse mix of experts who would have undertaken this task by the Monetary Council. Tell us what was the work of the committee? What did that entail? So the committee would have engaged with each other as it relates to the differing systems that exist within the ECCU. Currently, there are two different systems as it relates to land registration within the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. There's what is considered to be the registered land system, which Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Lucia and Montserrat have. We also have the unregistered land system, which is St. Vincent and the Grandines and Grenada. And then we have both Dominica as well as St. Kitts and Nevis having both a registered land system and an unregistered land system. So you could see the diversity that exists. Uh, and those were the discussions that were had with the committee. Indeed, there are the variance of systems. Coming out of this work, what were the recommendations? Did they answer the question, is a, un is a harmonized land system required within the ECCU? So the committee did make a recommendation to the Monetary Council in their report, which would have indicated that the ECCU can benefit from having a harmonized land registration system. So the system that I would have spoken about earlier, which is a registered land system, would have been the main recommendation of the committee. So based on the recommendation of the committee, the ECCB would have pioneered in November of 2017 the Electronic Conveyancing System project, which we're discussing today. Excellent. So let's talk about the project itself. We've gone and we've understood what the genesis behind it was. Let's talk about the project. What work is being done and who is actually carrying out the work of the project? So the central bank would have actually engaged the services of a legal drafting team, a consultancy team, led by Mr. John Ilu Charles of Dominica. He would have also been supported by Mr. Anthony Commodore, as well as Ms. Catherine Faustin. Both Mr. Charles and Mr. Commodore are both legal drafters with a number of years of experience. And Ms. Catherine Faustin is also a registrar, former registrar, uh, who has significant experience as it relates to land transactions in Dominica. So those three persons would have formed the consultancy team who would have led as it related to this project and of course engaging with the ECCB and collaborating with the ECCB on this matter. 
this project would have actually entailed three different phases. There was a desk review phase, there was a field research phase, and there was a legislative drafting phase. We've actually arrived at the end of the project, and right now we're embarking upon an intensive program of consultations. So as it related to both the desk review as well as the field research phase, the team would have actually had two meetings with chief parliamentary councils and legal drafters representing the governments of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union as well as the land registrars of the ECCU. And those meetings were geared towards discussing the findings of the consultancy team and also discussing the draft bill. Those meetings would have taken place in March 2018 and the second one would have taken place in August 2018. Ramona, out of these engagements and consultations, what would you say were the main outcomes and findings? Well, definitely the main outcome has been the draft harmonized land registration bill, which is a piece of legislation that captures all of the issues that have, would have been raised by the committee, as well as the results of the research by the team throughout the ECCU. A lot of work has taken place uh, in terms of the conveyancing system. What are the benefits for the people of the ECCU? What can they expect? So as it relates to the benefits from this project, it's a situation where we'll, we will now have a harmonized land registration system throughout the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, and that is expected to radically transform our economies. And it's a situation where we also expect to have an improved doing business ranking uh, throughout the ECCU, because if you want to do a land transaction in Dominica, it will be the exact same system or very similar system to doing a land transaction in St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis, Anguilla, pick an island, you'll be able to be familiar with what the system will be. For the people of the ECCU, land ownership is very important. Is. Our heritage and our culture speak to that. And this harmonized land registration bill will allow for easier transactions relating to land, transferring land, as well as being able to transfer land for generations to come. Ramona, indeed the electronic conveyancing system is something that the people of the ECCU can look forward to. Tell us what's next, what's on the agenda in terms of the advancement of the project. The consultancy team has delivered on the final report and the draft harmonized land registration bill, which is the final outcome of the e electronic conveyancing system project. And that bill as well as the report is available on the ECCB's website for consultation and for feedback. We've also circulated those documents to all the stakeholders that we would have engaged in since November of last year and we look forward to receiving their feedback because of the significance and importance. We will not be able to succeed without their input. Ramona, you've indicated that the draft bill is on the ECCB's website as well as available in member countries for public consultation. How long do persons have to provide their feedback on the bill? We would be grateful to receive feedback before the end of February 2019. So we're giving persons a nice window for them to be able to discuss it, to look at it, and to be able to supply that feedback to the central bank. We'll definitely look forward to receiving that input. Ramona, thanks for speaking with us today on ECCB Connects. Thank you for having me, Karina. It's been a pleasure. We tell you how to create healthy snacks for your child on this week's Inside Minute. Today, everyone is in a rush, and it might be difficult for working parents especially to ensure their child eats healthy. However, ensuring your child has the right amount of nutrients is important for learning and their overall well-being. Training your child from an early age to like the taste of fruits and vegetables ensures they eat healthy while growing. Instead of salty snacks, give your child a fruit or a fruit bowl. Encourage them to help you prepare it. Find fruits which are in season. Create smoothies with fruits. Instead of juice boxes, prepare fruit juices that are in season and give them to take to school. Ensure your child has and drinks adequate water, especially when the weather is hot. 
make vegetables a regular part of meals. Reduce or avoid altogether the amount of sodas, powdered mixed drinks and sugary foods, all of which puts your child at risk for chronic ailments such as juvenile diabetes and hypertension. Your child's health is everyone's wealth. Thanks for joining us on this week's Inside Story. We hope you enjoyed our program and we invite you to visit our Facebook pages for more. Remember, Inside Story is a production of the Agency for Public Information. I am Nadia Slater and I'll see you next week. <music>